But who signed it? We'll call this meeting of the uh, Christiansburg Town Council to order. Uh, as always, we will take a moment, a brief moment of reflection, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Good rise from the pledge. I'm going to ask uh, Councilman Sam Bishop if he would consent to lead us in this plan. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? <coughs> Hearing none, we will move forward. Our first items are the public hearings, proposed closure of Hickok Street to vehicular traffic from West Main Street to Commerce Street Northwest. Is there anyone here to address this issue? You will give us your name and address. Residence address. Residence address. Uh, my name is Julie Neal. I am at 1590 Smith Creek Road in Christiansburg. Um, good evening. My name is Julie Neal. I am the Director of Community Engagement for Christiansburg Presbyterian Church. And I'm speaking on behalf of the session, which is the church's governing body. First, the session would like to express its gratitude to Randy Wingfield and Andrew Warren for their information sharing visit at our April session meeting. And to the late Bill Aldridge for the conversations he had with us in the past regarding the creation of an event center on Hickok Street. Given that our church building is immediately adjacent to Hickok Street and this potential event center, we have a keen interest in what takes place there. We're excited about the possibilities that could come with the development of an event center in Christiansburg. And we very much want to work with the town of Christiansburg in a collaborative capacity throughout the planning process. We believe that open communication and collaboration with downtown groups and businesses will make this an even more successful and effective venture for all involved. That being said, we also need to express our concerns about the proposed plan that was shared with us at our April session meeting. A plan which we understand would include the imminent permanent closure of Hickok Street between Main and Commerce Streets through the placement of removable bollards at a cost of several thousand dollars. <coughs> Excuse me. We also understand that the next phase of the plan is to totally reconstruct this section of Hickok Street as early as 2019. We question the financial decision to install these bollards now, knowing they would have to be removed in less than a year's time. We believe it is reasonable to suggest that you continue the use of temporary barriers for the time being when events such as the farmer's market and other street festivals require them. Christiansburg Presbyterian Church has an entrance and exit directly from Hickok Street. This portion of the driveway is used regularly, not only by our congregation, but by non-church groups that use space in our building throughout the week, and by people of the community who make use of our church parking lot and playground every day. This entrance and exit is a key means of access to our building's covered entrance, an intentionally planned underpass <coughs> Structure that connects to the building's main entrances. Additionally, closing Hickok Street would, un would undoubtedly increase the amount of cut-through traffic that passes through the church parking lot between Main Street and College Street. Permanent closure of Hickok Street would have a significant adverse impact on our church in terms of convenience, but more importantly, safety. We question the need for a permanent closure of Hickok Street at this time, since our understanding is that it will not be until the summer of 2020 at the earliest that the event center would have permanent improvements and structures that would necessitate the prohibition of traffic on the street. We urge you to consider whether permanent closure is necessary at this time. 
particularly with so little notice to the church. We respectfully request that we be given time to discuss this further with our congregation in order to get a clearer picture of their concerns, given the short timeline you're proposing, and to have a more in-depth discussion with Mr. Warren and Mr. Winfield in the spirit of transparency and collaboration. Finally, we have two specific requests of the town council if the town council decides to move ahead with the plans outlined for us. First, assuming bollards will be installed this year, we would ask that they be removed for Sunday services at a minimum and as needed by request for larger church functions. Second, if Hickok Street is permanently closed to traffic, either in the near future or several years from now, we're asking for the town to provide whatever modifications are needed to the paved drive behind our church building so that we will be able to continue using the covered entrance in the safest way possible. We also ask the town to provide means for the church to reduce cut through traffic in the parking lot. On behalf of Christiansburg Presbyterian Church, I thank you for your consideration of these remarks. And I do have some printed copies if you would like to pass them. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here to address this issue? Before we move on, may I address Ms. Neal's comments? Sure. Okay. Uh, Ms. Neal, the street committee met uh, earlier on your request, and there's going to be some more coordination with you. Uh, we are, uh, the street committee will make a recommendation to council on this matter. Uh, your concerns are duly noted, and if there's any partner, if there's not a more important important partner than we need or want on, you know, anything we do in this area than the, than the church. So hopefully... You, well, the street committee met, and you will be uh, engaged further on this because, with the goal of having, a, you know, something that, that the church can support and feel good about, and so appreciate your comments, and it's, it, it, it hasn't fallen on deaf ears. We appreciate your questions. Mm -hmm. We also feel that the or the mentioned construction two years is going to be necessary because we're rerouting stormwater down through there depending on the grant monies and things that are available so it it is scheduled open or closed to be shut down for a while during that, during that construction period so all right anything anyone else to address this issue hearing none we will close this portion of the public hearing and go to conditional use permit request by roger Woody. <coughs> For a approximate 2.209 acre portion of tax map 5238, I'm sorry, 528 A3 83, located in the, at 1145 Roanoke Street to construct seven single family dwellings in the B3 General Business District. The property is designated as residential on the future land use map of the 2013 Christiansburg Comprehensive Plan. Is there anyone here to address this issue? Name, address, so on and so forth. Thank you. I'm Doug Meredith with LMW Engineering. I run up Virginia. Uh, we're doing work with the uh, Showcase Home Builders. I'm just here to answer any questions after Mr. Warren gives his presentation. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Hearing none, we will close the public hearing. Uh, the next thing is an agreement to amend Regional Solid Waste Authority Articles of Incorporation. Mr. Wingfield? Hey, uh, there's a, basically a desire to amend the Articles of Incorporation for the Water Authority to allow for staggered terms for the authority members, uh, representatives. That's just to provide more continuity for uh, the board members. That, that way uh, you wouldn't have the potential for so many board members leaving potentially one year. Right now, the board is comprised of five, five members. Uh, there's one pointed by each locality and then one at large member. And if you were to have, say, two or three localities appoint a new person in give, any given year, you might have a significant amount of new board members. Uh, but with the staggering of terms, it just kind of helps create a little more continuity. Okay. Thank you. And, and also, the agreement right now is set to expire I believe in 2019, and this would extend it out to 2025. 
Okay, I believe that Sorry. issue will come up later in the uh, discussion and action by council. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, but it is just a change in the terms, staggered terms. It's, it's a change in the terms and it's a change in the duration of the agreement. It okay. extends the agreement. And actually, I think it's from 2025 to 2040 is when it's extended to. Okay, very good. Anyone else to address this issue? Then I will formally close the public hearing. Uh, under the consent agenda, we have a council meeting minutes of April 3, April 10, April 18, 2018. Uh, monthly bills, amendment of uh, town procurement and surplus prop property manual, and to schedule a public hearing on June 12, uh, 2018 for a resigning request by Guy Matthew and Wendy W. Funk at 1800 Depot Street Northeast, tax map number 498A90 and 498A90A in the B3 General Business Zoning District to R1 Single Family Residential Zoning. The property is designated as residential on a future land use map of uh, Town of Christiansburg 2013. Uh, that is, uh, I think we have make a motion we approve the consent agenda and also with the minor adjustments made that we got by email earlier today I said got a motion a second discussion <coughs> Madam Clark yes sir Councilman Bishop uh -huh. Councilman Collins aye Councilman Hopper aye Councilwoman Sachs aye Councilman Showalter aye Councilman Stipes aye 36 oh thank you very much Next portion of this meeting is the citizens' comments. We will be able to address council on items of concern. Uh, we ask that you come forward, give your name, your residential address, and your limit your conversation or speech to us for three minutes. So anyone that would like to approach council. Good evening, I'm William Kraft, 1005 Madison Lane, Blacksburg, Virginia. I've had to make a change on what I wanted to talk about tonight. Um, this is uh, what I'm going to comment now on, and I'm going to ask, you, uh, ask for your help with this. The, uh, the noise ordinance you're getting ready to consider has uh, left out a crucial exception. My understanding is that uh, your legal counsel wants that left out because of uh, having a neutral content. And the exception I'm speaking of is church activities, the ringing of bells, um, those sort of things that take place on Sundays and for funerals and that sort of thing. In the last ordinance, that was exempted. In this ordinance, it's not mentioned. Um, I posed a question uh, to Chief Sisson that Sunday morning at 11 o'clock when Christiansburg Presbyterian Church rings that bell, I can promise you that it's going to violate the noise ordinance. If someone calls, what will he do? As it stands, he has to send an officer. And I don't think that's, I don't know how to address that. I don't know how you want to address that, but I'm fairly certain there's not one of you wants to see that happen. Uh, I would ask you to either postpone this ordinance or have some discussion about what can you do to prevent that circumstance from occurring. Uh, otherwise, what you got to do is uh, have every church in Christiansburg get a uh, conditional use permit. And I'm not sure that's something they're going to want to do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Craig. Anyone else? <clears throat> Jared and Marie March, residential address 2198 Sowers Road, Floyd, Virginia. We have businesses at 2440 Roanoke Street, Fatback Soul Shack, and 1465 Roanoke Street, New South Park. With regard to the noise ordinance, in the work session last week, a number of you expressed an interest in finding some way to grandfather in some of the businesses that were going to be affected by this. There's two main businesses right now that are actively involved in this. Us, that's my back soul shack in the starlight. Uh, that was poo-pooed by legal counsel 
uh, because of discrimination concerns, it's our belief that this ordinance, as written, will immediately place Starlight and us in violation. We see this as a targeted use of this ordinance to discriminate against our businesses. I've got a problem with the CUP application. Number one is the cost. Obviously, there's been some discussion about the cost. $750 is exorbitant. Whether you have $750 worth of work to do or not, I don't know. But to place that burden on a business for a conditional use permit is ridiculous. We also don't want to be subjected to the subjectivity of this council or any council to do something that we already have the right to do under the current code. We have built our businesses under the current code, which as we read it, as our council reads it, businesses are exempted when they create noise in the course of doing their business in a business district, as currently written. We built our business on that ordinance. We also don't appreciate the potential for having to reapply for a conditional use permit. As far as decibels, I see decibels as a great tool if you're trying to compare your Tesla against your Chevy in a laboratory. I do not see that as an excellent way to measure our noise or any other noise in a community where there's tremendous amount of ambient noise. After our last meeting, I measured the noise at the Shell station on Roanoke Street. It varied from 65 to 90 decibels. How is any officer going to respond to that call and try to assign where those decibels are coming from when your noise expert last week at your work session said you can't identify where those decibels come from? Those are air pressure variations. Unenforceable. The code as written is unenforceable, unless this is a laboratory. We have a solution. It's been presented a number of times to council, first time about a year ago, and it is circulating around here. It is a tourism district zoning. We think Roanoke Street would be a prime candidate for a tourism district zoning. Take from the starlight to the interstate, or you can expand or contract that as you see fit. That is provided for in the state code. That would give you the ability to exempt businesses in a non-discriminatory fashion if they happen to reside in that district. This is a practical solution to the problem. It does not discriminate against us on your part. We will not feel discriminated against because you're targeting us. Thank you, Mr. Marsh. And it's the opportunity around. for additional businesses in the tourism district. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else here to address this issue? <laughs> Jonathan Taylor, 685 School Lane, Christian's River, Virginia. I'd just like to point out if you do pass the current ordinance as it stands, that Mr. Mayor, if you're mowing your lawn and I'm walking down the street, you're in violation of the noise ordinance and I can call Chief Citizen and he can come write you a violation. No, or you misread or, everything, but that's okay. I misread everything. Yes, sir. Or if your lawn mowing company is or my neighbor, there's going to be issues on this ordinance. That's my piece about the ordinance. What I'd like to really say is that I believe hell is frozen over this weekend. Not only has Steve Hucker come to the Starlight Drive-In, but the mayor has as well. And the mayor also commented that we should raise our noise coming from our speakers because he said he couldn't hardly hear it. So just so everyone's aware about that. Within that reason. On, Within reason. You understand correct. that. That happened on Saturday. But it, Mr. Mayor, it'd be nice if I could finish my speech so right without... The mayor's just right. truthful. Thank you. Go ahead. The tourism district that was proposed is a great option for the town to end the feud between businesses and the governing body. It provides more tourism dollars to come in. It provides more money to be spent in town by hotels, restaurants, and it puts Christiansburg back, back on the map. We're not running businesses out. We're bringing them back in. Please, please understand that if you pass this ordinance, you throw this tourism zone down the drain, that businesses are going to start moving. Christiansburg is going to fall off the map. Because as it stands, Withville and Hillsville are already calling local businesses to bring them down the road. Thank you. Thank you. Let me address something in this. I know that it's your public hearing, but I think that the, the lawnmower and general noise maintenance was addressed in the work session, and it does not apply if you're doing normal maintenance. 
yard work, this type thing on your ordinance. Do I understand that correctly? Yes. So, how does that pertain to a small business owner that runs a lawn mowing company? It's the same, same difference. So they're exempt? You're exempt from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. That seems like discrimination <laughs> from one business to another. Right. Yeah. Right, thank you. Anyone else? I'd like to um, I'll give my perspective. My name is Leslie Brooks. I'm a recording artist. I'm also an artist on the Crooked Road Tour. Um, I'm a songwriter and I like to write about issues. And your, your address, I, please. Oh, my address. I live in uh, Blacksburg, 3520 Mount Zion. Thank you. I do a lot of business in Christiansburg. And I play music in Christiansburg. And I, I'm very blessed and fortunate to have a couple of um, venues like the Fatback Soul Shack and Do South that supports my music. And I'm trying to support a child in college. And I also have their expensive musician equipment that, that I need to support. So that's important to me. And so, you know, the Lord says to make a joyful noise. But I'm a little bit offended by the word noise. Because when I'm playing music, um, it's music. It's not noise. And where the Soul Shack is located, it's located in the right in the heart of how many interstates, 81, 460. I mean, I couldn't go there and sing and busk without a PA system if I tried because of the noise of the freeway. But I got to thinking about it today. And I assume everyone in this room likes music. We can all agree on that, that it's a universal language. And I thought about it, and I thought about Don McLean's song, The Day the Music Died. But you know what, folks? I wish it was funny, because that's what's going to happen. So I just wanted to do a little bit. If you want to just cut me off, you can. I'll be offended, but... Give it a I can still remember how the music made Christian's Berg smile. <laughs> And I know when I had my chance, I could make those people dance and maybe make them happy for a while. A siren screamed and made me shiver. A silent sound of the songs I delivered. Bad news for the town. They don't want me around. I remember how our spirits froze. When the Huckleberry night spot closed, something touched us deep inside the day the music died. So bye bye, Miss American Pie. Throw a kiss to the soul shack and nostalgic starlight. <laughs> But I guess I'll drive by the day the music died. Now just who writes the book of love? Thank you, ma'am. Your, 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 your time is up. Protest the cause. Do you believe in Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. That's definitely a tough act to follow. Uh, Stacy Martin, 1480 Turnberry Lane, Reiner, Virginia. My taxpayer address, though, in Christiansburg is 782 Never Road. Many of you know me, some of you do not. I'm a certified financial planner with 20 years of economic forecasting and wealth management experience. I have 40 years of small business, family owned experience also. I own my own financial practice. I own Venture Hobbies and Toys, and T and Totally Gifts in the Mall. From this experience and perspective is how I wish to discuss this issue tonight. We are at a crossroads in Christiansburg, it's history. A struggle of the type of community that we are and the type of community we wish to become. Tonight, U.S. Council Men and Women can either demonstrate that you stand for freedom and justice of all, which includes businesses. For years, whether local or non-businesses have been taken advantage of, 
abused and robbed, yes, robbed, of their hard-earned community-based businesses. To think any different, either one does not even know the facts, has not been a business person, or has to be indifferent. Certainly, not all of these issues have been created by the town. However, many have and can be controlled by our local government. So the question is, is how did we get here? That brings us to tonight, the very same opportunity to beat back the indifference or lack of regard for economic, hardworking local business women and men, the threat of the economic community. This decision tonight, or lack of, will resonate for many years to come. Remember the 1970s, our beautiful antebellum courthouse, the discussion, I remember as a child, to tear it down or to leave or renovate it and build something else. Well, the progressive said, let's tear it down, it'd be prettier. Who here is gonna argue that they made the wrong decision? They made the wrong decision. It changed the character of our town forever. So, the last time this code was written, and whoever thought the two fine outstanding businesses like the Soul Shack and Starlight Drive-In would ever been called into question, taken to court, or even called the police on. After all, the code did say the businesses were exempt. Well, that would never happen, right? Well, it did. Now the amnesia of the business exemption has sat in, and also the obstinacy of even admitting that they were exempt in the first place, even, even though the courts agreed. Now we're in this place right now. We got here the same way, by a decision. It is not one person or one councilman's fault, and some issues were not even decided by the majority of this council. But, for example, the rain tax was. This proposal, the sound ordinance was written concerning three things. Ambient noise is not handled. How will it be handled? That was brought up by the marches. I fear the code can be weaponized and can be interpreted in the future if and when an issue arises. Solution? Have the Planning Commission to review all complaints before a ticket is issued and an investigation among a citizen panel that includes business owners. Finally, the code will, will be near impossible and impede future business growth in an economic environment where retail comes last and an event-based entertainment first environment has developed. And this should be playing right in the hands of the Starlight. For example, I was in Orlando this Thank last you, week. Mr. Martin. Hey, three minutes, Yeah, good. No one else. Chris Walks, 1370 Ridge. Um, some of my concerns about this Um You all reviewed the Winchester Ordinance, or some of you did. Um, and in this ordinance, some of the important things of that are left out. There, ambient noise is considered. And the DB reading has to be 10 above the ambient noise level, which for the fat back would be the ambient noise level of 81. It's pretty loud. Another is that the measurement has to be taken from inside the building of the container. As the ordinance reads now, basically, you can go up to the fence behind the starlight on that person's property and take the reading there <coughs> instead of inside the residence. And uh, also, up until last Wednesday at the uh, the work session, it was told to the citizenry that this would be a complaint-based system up until last week. And then we were informed by Chief Sisson that, well, no, if my officers are driving around and they hear something, well, they can issue a citation. That leaves it up to the officer. You know, the officer may not be offended by say Taylor Swift being played loudly. But I can think of a few bands like NWA and Body Count that have written some songs that may offend police officers. Would they then take it down and let someone else go? That's not how ord ordinances should be. If it's a complaint-based system, you should put it in the, in the ordinance and not, you know, say, well, it's complaint-based up until we decide it's not. And also, if, you, if it were a state agency, State agencies are required to think about the economic impact. They have to do an economic impact, impact analysis for businesses, which hasn't been done here. As a matter of fact, as far as I know, nobody even knows how many businesses will be affected. You know, maybe you should think about that before you pass this ordinance and look at some of the things from the Winchester ordinance and see if maybe that should also be incorporated. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Bob. Anyone else? Hearing no one, I'll close the citizens' comment. I'm sorry. Did not see you back there, Dr. Sullivan. I'm John Casali, 385 Emerald Boulevard, Christiansburg. I really had a plan to speak tonight, but uh, some some statement was attributed to me at the work session, so I thought I'd simply address that. Uh, as you know, I've tried to just help with this ordinance strictly from a technical standpoint and not be on any particular side of the issue. I will say that I think the decibel measurements are necessary in any modern noise ordinance. They're objective, they're quantitative, they're enforceable. Any model or noise ordinance that you look at will have that type of measurement. The Supreme Court in 2009 in the state of Virginia uh, basically did away with ordinances which were strictly subjective. So I, I believe the decibels are important. The issue of being able to distinguish an event-based sound from an ambient noise in the background was addressed at your work session, as the earlier speaker said. Um, you know, you have an ordinance which can distinguish that because it's an either-or ordinance. Where a sound level meter cannot be intelligent to the difference between, say, music and noise, the human ear can, plainly <coughs> audible in the ordinance for that purpose. You can distinguish the signals as long as the signal, the music, is high enough above the noise. So that's a difficult issue, but you have dealt with it in your ordinance. I also will tell you that event-based noise is likely to fluctuate where a lot of the ambient will not, and the sound level meter will reflect that fluctuation on its readout. With respect to measurement indoors that was just mentioned versus outdoors, it's my belief, having experienced a lot of measurements with noise ordinances, that the great bulk of your measurements will end up being outdoors. You have receiving property-based noise ordinance, which is appropriate. When you move the measurement indoors and you take a microphone, in a reverberant environment, then you're going to get much more complex with your measurement specification and have to identify how far away you're away from the wall, etc. It becomes very complex. And finally, um, I would just say that the question about the exemption for church bells, I agree with that. It's a needed exemption. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sutton. Anyone else? My name is Shannon Dove, and I live at 3948 Stanley Road. So I'm here tonight um, on behalf of the beloved Starlight Drive-In, a small family business that only operates approximately 60 days out of the year. I think it would be a shame if the town imposed impossible measures on this facility as well as others like it in the community. The Starlight Drive-In has provided a safe, family fun atmosphere for 65 years. Um, Montgomery County would truly suffer if the Starlight Drive-In closed because there's nothing else that you can compare it to. What's better than sitting out on a warm summer night watching a movie? Um, mayor and council members, um, I hope that there's a peaceful resolution to this cell ordinance. Thank you. Anyone else? Hearing none, I'll close the citizens' comments section. We will go into introductions and presentations. And I'm going to change the batting order. I think we have a young lady from Christiansburg High School uh, on the town council partnership. I'm going to ask her if she would like to present first. <laughs> Um, hi, I'm Sydney Johnson, and I'm with Student Government Association, that is with um, Christiansburg High School. So just a little bit about myself, I'm graduating this year, and I'll be going to James Madison University where I'll be studying nursing. Um, I'm a part of SGA, um, Beta Club, Varsity Soccer, National Honor Society, and Christiansburg Outreach, which is like a really small club where we pack food bags for kids that don't have food over the weekend. 
and um, I'm just here to inform you guys on some upcoming events that we have going on in school. So later this week we have a dodgeball tournament that SGA is hosting and all of the proceeds will be donated to a local food bank. And this upcoming Saturday is also our junior and senior program, <coughs> which will be at St. Corn Farm. Um, also coming up is our senior awards. That'll be May 6th. And a drama day camp, which is this summer, for kids who like theater and performances. And they'll be a part of Kid Frankenstein and Jack and the Beanstalk. As most of you all know, we have a lovely field to play on this year. It's torn up and we're getting a new track and a new turf put in. And it'll be an eight lane rubberized track with circling the field. And yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. I talked to the principal uh, was last week and he said that the track and the field will be ready by June 30th, which I thought was very nice, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah, great. And they got all the equipment out there now. Very good, thank you. <clears throat> Introduction of new employees. Jim Lansonese, Grant Hoover, Justin Shepard, Casper Vallette, the Public Works Department. We're going to introduce some new, uh, new faces to the crews. Yes, sir. Good evening, Mayor, Council. It's my pleasure to introduce Ms. Tanya Lilly. Uh, Tanya came to the Public Works Department on April 9th as an administrative specialist. She has over 20 years of administrative and human resources experience and has a degree in medical billing and coding and also draws pencil portraits in her spare time. She has two grown daughters, uh, Tori and Taylor, and two grandchildren, Aaliyah and Ayla. I messed that up all day. Tony was born in Winfield and is currently living in Max Meadows with her fiance. She typically uh, finds herself back in Christiansburg over the weekends for shopping and dining and is excited to be a part of the team. Thank you, Tony. I'd like to introduce the new team of our school model crew, Brother Horst, William Starkey. William was originally from Chesapeake, Virginia, where he moved up here to attend Virginia Tech, which graduated history in 2017. He's worked in the construction industry both before and after graduation, moving into full time, which I consider as a valuable asset. And then in his spare time, William enjoys wood carving and hiking. Thank you. Welcome aboard. Good evening. I've got Daniel Simpkins here with me. Uh, he came down to Public Works in the middle of March. Uh, he is our newest truck driver on our concrete group, the Streets Division. He graduated from Auburn High School a few years ago. Uh, while he was in high school, he was a farmhand on a dairy farm. And then um, when he graduated high school, he worked for VDOT as a 1,500-hour um, employee and wanted to get a full-time job in the same line of work. So we brought him on board. Uh, we're pleased to have him. He's definitely proven to be an asset. In his free time, uh, he likes to work on his farm, uh, fish, hunt, basically anything outdoors. Good afternoon. I'm here to introduce Lucas Kearns. Luke is from Wise, Virginia. He holds a bachelor's degree in environmental resource management from Virginia Tech. Um, I think I got ahead of myself. He's our new traffic technician control trainee. Um, Luke enjoys hiking, hunting, fishing, and cooking. But previous to working here, he worked as a forest ward warden with uh, Scott County, Virginia Department of Forestry. He's married and lives in Redford. Thank you. Jerry Henline. Jerry Henline, going twice. Apparently he's not here this evening. Very good. Rescue Chief Joe Coyle to present on Rescue Squad operations and activities. Joe? Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Thank you for having me. Uh, I promise I'll be very brief tonight. I know I just want to talk to you about some of the, the cool stuff we've been doing at Rescue. <clears throat> so 
So um, over the last I don't know, two and a half, three years, as I've done presentations, um, you've heard me allude to, to some of the programs that, that we've started to institute, especially as it relates to heart care. And so what I wanted to do was update you tonight on some of the successes and the statistical data that we have. We're, we're pretty impressed <coughs> with the heart program that we have. Next slide there. Sorry. Uh, and, and our mission, uh, you know, delivering high quality health care, and our vision actually, uh, I know we're talking a little smack here, but we're proud of it, is, is being recognized as the EMS agency, pretty much that others want to be. Um, that, that is our vision as an agency. Next slide. Two things I want to talk to you just briefly about tonight in, in terms of the initiatives we've been doing for the last couple of years uh, are how we approach and take care of patients having a heart attack. Uh, and a heart attack is when the, the heart muscle is starved for blood. The person's still alive, they're still talking and breathing, but their heart muscle is starved for blood. It's a very serious condition and we don't do a good job putting a system together to take care of them, uh, the difference in outcome is, is somebody who is sitting on their porch watching somebody else play with their kids because they can't, or being able to go out and play with their kids. So in terms of heart care and heart attack care, we're really looking at improving people's quality of life and the outcome. The second thing I'm going to talk about is cardiac arrest survival. Cardiac arrest is when the person's heart has actually stopped. They have no heartbeat, they're not breathing. So obviously an immediately life-threatening condition. Next. So in terms of our, our heart care, um, we use the term STEMI, so I'll throw that out. That's a, a medical term, meaning a, a myocardial infarction, a heart attack that we can see on the heart monitor. Um, we have demonstrated to the American Heart Association, which is the body that evaluates heart care, uh, our, our prowess and our ability. So in 2016, we won the Silver Award, because we really just started instituting some of the changes uh, that would really define how we take care of heart patients. In 2017, we really stepped up the game and we won the Gold Plus Award, which is the highest award from the American Heart Association uh, for heart care for EMS agencies. And in 2018, next slide there, uh, Dustin Williams, our Deputy Chief, as we are speaking right now, is at an AHA conference in North Carolina accepting our award for 2018. So that was his picture in 2017, and we just officially got word that we were, were uh, awarded the 2018 Gold Plus Award for EMS. So what does that mean? It means we had to kind of change the way we approached heart attack care. Historically, we'd arrive at somebody's house, they're having chest pain, and we would do what we've been trained to do for decades as EMS providers. We'd check vital signs, we'd do their history, we'd take a lot of notes, we'd put them on the stretcher in the ambulance, and then start doing everything on the way to the hospital. We turned that upside down. So now our providers immediately acquire a 12-lead EKG, and we've had the stickers all over your chest if you've ever had that done. And right there at the patient's bedside, they'll recognize they're having a heart attack. And as part of our process, we work with the hospitals, uh, both in the NRB and in, in the Roanoke area, so that our providers could just call on the telephone and say, hey, I'm looking at the monitor, I have a heart attack, get your cath lab ready because we're coming. And that was a crucial step in cutting down the time uh, to get the patient from their bed and to where they're putting a needle up in their heart to open up the blockage. Uh, and that's the metric we go by. It's the first medical contact, our contact with the patient, to device time. And the AHA says 90 minutes. You don't want anybody outside of 90 minutes. And we're consistently in the 60 minute range, which is why we got the Gold Plus Ordinance. Because we changed how our providers think and the system that we put in place. And a lot of credit to Dustin. Dustin did a lot of the work with the ERs uh, and the cath labs getting those systems <coughs> in place. So we're really, really impressed with our, uh, our heart attack here. Next slide. Internally, we incentivize our folks. So that coin up there is, is a Christiansburg um, Golden Heart Award. And we give that to providers. They have to earn that. So they have to be a member of a team who met some pretty exacting criteria when it came to taking care of a person that was having that STEM. So they had to have the 12 lead acquired in a certain amount of time. They had to get the patient to a cath lab in a certain amount of time. A lot of uh, metrics had to be in place to qualify for the Golden Heart Award. It is very competitive in our agency to get one of those coins, so it's things that they really try for. <clears throat> we were at a conference uh, in March, 
and we were approached by a, a rep from the American Heart Association and our STEMI challenge and our Golden Heart Award actually made it into the American Heart Association's internal staff newsletter as kind of a best practice. So we're really very proud of that. Um, that again was the brainchild of Dustin, our deputy chief. Next, I'm going to talk to you just uh, a little bit about ROS. So when somebody is in cardiac arrest, they're not breathing, they have no pulse, our first end game, the thing we want to accomplish is getting their pulse restored, return of spontaneous circulation. That is, that's what our mission is out in the field. Traditionally, what we had been trained for is decades as EMS providers here and elsewhere was we got on scene as a paramedic, we would immediately take care of the patient's airway but the emphasis from that point was to get them in the ambulance, drive really fast to the ER, and do everything en route to the ER. That's how, that was the game in EMS. The 10 minute clock there is because that's what we were judged by. Were you on scene 10 minutes or less? If you were over 10 minutes, you had to answer to your medical director or a QA officer about why you were there not getting the patient to the ER. Next slide. What the research, the evidence-based medicine showed though was that didn't work. It didn't work for us. It didn't work for anybody across the country. Um, so seven, eight years ago, our return of circulation rates, in other words, the number of people out of 100 that we would actually get a pulse back, 2 to 4%, okay, really low. That was not unusual across the country because everybody in the country was doing EMS this way. We thought, wow, we just got to transport them to somebody that can do something. Didn't work. So a complete shift in methodology. Next slide. So we looked at the evidence, we, we looked at the really high performing EMS systems across the country, ones have really, really good rates, and we said, okay, we've got to do some specific things uh, so we can take better care of our citizens. <coughs> we developed agency specific protocols for cardiac arrest. We very early broke away from the region and developed protocols that allowed us to make these changes. Protocols are the, the standards of care that an uh, EMS provider has to follow when they take care of a patient. We use a pit crew approach. So one person, the EMS supervisor, the, the person who's in charge of the team, is directing all of the other providers on the scene, but probably not touching the patient themselves, kind of like a NASCAR pit crew. The pit crew boss tells everybody their assignments, and they carry them out very quickly and efficiently. Instead of focusing on the airway, we focus on CPR and electricity. So we look for people that have rhythms we can shock. That's the people we have the best chance of saving. And we focus on high quality CPR. We will have extended scene times, 45 minutes to an hour for most cardiac arrests. We don't transport anybody, with very few exceptions, we don't transport anybody who's currently in cardiac arrest. We transport them after we get a pulse back and we stabilize them. But our on-scene efforts are incredibly aggressive and really focused on getting Ross back and getting the patient stabilized. So here's the results. This is what I wanted to show you. So remember, two to four percent was our initial rate, perhaps back in 2010, 2011. So right now, our return of circulation results over the last 24 months, for all cardiac arrest patients, we've increased it to 31%, so an, an amazing increase. If the first rhythm that we saw as a medic was not shockable, that, that's a rhythm that normally is not going to be survivable anyhow, we've increased it to 27%, so 27 out of every 100. And here's the one where we really excel. If the first rhythm that presented was a shockable rhythm, 62% of the time we're going to save that person. 62. And that's a statistic, but to me that represents people that are now walking around and, and with their families instead of six feet under. So really, really impressive stuff we're doing. And we're doing it with the support that, that you folks have provided us. We're very appreciative of that. Next. There were some other elements that were necessary. You know, it, it takes a whole system. We can't just do it as an agency. Several years ago, um, with Council's blessing, we were able to purchase numerous automatic defibrillators and deploy them in the Christianburg police vehicles. So every patrol vehicle uh, has an, an AED. Very frequently, when we arrive on the scene of a cardiac arrest call, the officer has already applied the AED and started CPR. That is a crucial, crucial step in any system that wants to have high return of circulation rates. So we're really appreciative of the police department's efforts. We also have them in fire vehicles, and we also have them at all of the town facilities. The other thing we have is a robust CPR program. We're actually transitioning probably next month to an event right format where people can go online and register for our classes. But we have a CPR coordinator and a cadre of CPR instructors. And we really, really want to push having citizens know CPR. Even if we're in our trucks and go out the door as soon as a call is dispatched, what really helps us, helps us get Ross 
is when a bystander started CPR immediately. It's so, so incredibly helpful. And actually, our CPR coordinator was here. There's Toby in the back. He was our CPR coordinator. So if you want a CPR class, Toby can set that up. All right. <clears throat> because we were on scene for a long time, it changed some other things. So as you can imagine, historical EMS, they came to your house, your loved one was in a crisis, they grabbed them, put them on a stretcher, really quickly went to the hospital. That was EMS. Did some things in route. But now we're on scene for 45 minutes to an hour with someone who has no pulse and is not breathing. It's very, very, very psychologically traumatic for the family. So to meet that need, we created a chaplain team. So we have a cadre of trained providers. These are people who are experienced at emergency medical services, but also have received training or in their other life are counselors or ministers or have the ability to talk with people who are grief stricken. So they really do two things. They come to the scene, they're a buffer for us so that we can focus on taking care of the patient, but they're, they're counseling and ministering to that family right there at the scene, explaining what's going on and why we're doing what we can to best take care of them. They also look out for us, because EMS can be a rough business. We see things, just like the police department, the fire department, we see things that uh, you know really wear on us. And so they exist to help us with, with critical stress management and debriefing. They take really good care of us. Our lead chaplain, actually, is currently on the way to South Carolina. He's attending a nationwide conference on public safety chaplaincy. So he's hoping to bring back some ideas to train the rest of the team. Really, really good group. These are all volunteers that do this. So really helpful group. All right, moving away from heart care, um, something that's coming down the pipe, so hopefully in a couple of years I'll be giving you some statistics, and I promise I'll wrap up here pretty quick. EMS ultrasound. So this is something that we're doing. Very few EMS agencies right now in the Commonwealth are doing it. Across the nation, it is becoming the standard of care. But we do ultrasound in the back of the truck, so we're on the side of the road. Next slide, that's the ultrasound machine. It's a paramedic level skill, which means only a certain group of people can do it. It's the highest certified folks in an EMS agency. It requires a lot of special training and a rigorous clearance process. So currently, we've just rolled out our program. So currently, we have five paramedics who are cleared, three more in the process, and then we're working on setting up the next training class. I, I will actually be in the next training class, so I just have to kind of stand and watch and awe as they do this. But it's pretty fantastic, the things that they can do with this. Next slide. So when we were talking about EMS ultrasound, I said, what, what can it do to benefit a patient? It can do a lot of things. If a patient has been traumatized, hit by a car, fallen off a roof, fallen out of a tree, shot, things like that, we can actually ultrasound their belly and look for blood in places it shouldn't be. So we know right away that patient has to go to a level one trauma center. They're gonna have to go to Roanoke, perhaps on a helicopter. Really, really important. We can differentiate when somebody's having trouble breathing. We can actually ultrasound their lungs and determine what the most likely cause of that breathing problem is so we can treat it correctly. Cardiac evaluation and resuscitation. It tells us, does this person need more fluid or do we need to give them a drug that constricts their blood vessels to raise their blood pressure? Stroke diagnosis, confirming that we've appropriately placed an airway. Dozens and dozens of more things are available to the EMS practitioner to benefit the patient when you have ultrasound. Right now, we, like I said, we have five that are cleared to use it. Uh, so usually it'll be on the supervisor vehicle. We're getting ready to put the second one out in service and it'll be on our first run truck. So it has some pretty wide dispersion. Right, that's the medical stuff. I get a question, council, quite frankly, about the status of our volunteer program. We have a very robust volunteer program. And actually this year, uh, we reorganized the volunteer structure, uh, officer structure, and we created a volunteer recruiting officer. And her entire function, 100% of her job, is to recruit and onboard the new volunteers. And so she sets up uh, quarterly uh, recruit weekends to bring the folks on board, um, but she's using a variety of formats, social media, word of mouth, advertising, a lot of different things to increase our membership numbers. We're holding steady at about 70. We do have turnover, we budget for turnover, but our, our numbers tend to average around 70. We want to increase that over the next fiscal year to about 80 to 90. So 80 is our conservative number, 90 is kind of our optimal number. Because as you are already aware, we've become a, a fairly busy EMS agency. That's the recruiting side. We also do some things for retention to keep our current folks. We have instituted a member of the month program, which has become really popular. The member of the month is a peer nominated and selected position, and they get a certificate, they get a challenge coin, not the Golden Heart Award though, because they have to earn that one. And they actually get um, the parking place right next to the front door. So it's kind of a, a, a thing for Steve. So that's really helped us with some recruiting. Because we're trying to be very creative in, in recognizing and thanking the folks that volunteer their time. Now, I've talked about the cool stuff. I didn't want to end. I, I got a, a good lesson today about educating folks and things we're not doing anymore. And uh, 
I, I get a call occasionally from a family member of a patient. They'll say, hey, you know, your folks came out and you know, they're really nice to my son, daughter, brother, mother, whatever. But man, they were in a car wreck and y'all folks didn't use a backboard. Well, it's because we don't use backboards anymore. Uh, Evidence-based medicine said backboards have no proven benefit but proven harm. So in almost all cases, we have eliminated the use of backboarding for patients who have spinal injuries or maybe in a wreck. So I just want you to know, if, you, if we have to transport you and you've been a wreck, you can be able to ride on a soft cot, not on the hard backboard. I think I went a little over on my time, but I just wanted some cool stuff I wanted to tell you about. So any questions? Well done. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Under committee reports, Councilman Collins and Stipes, Street Committee report recommendation on subdivision plat showing new lots one and two from a portion of tax map 406A19 located near the Shoppers Way Northwest at North Franklin Street intersection. A simple request this evening or, or plat for approval. This is the power strip that has uh, what you see there in the lower right hand corner. Well, the entire parcel is the parent parcel, the original parcel. The current owners would like to divide it into three parcels. Uh, lot one is Olive Garden, lot two is Panera, and the remainder is uh, the power strip there. It's a simple subdivision request. It's, it's, it simply gives the owner the flexibility to, uh, you know, exercise options with each of the properties. Uh, it meets our subdivision ordinance and the zoning ordinance, and the street committee has reviewed it and recommends approval of the plat as presented to council. I'll make that recommendation in the form of a motion. I second it. <coughs> We've got a motion and a second. Any discussion or questions from council? Madam Clark? Yes, sir. Councilman Bishop? Aye. Councilman Collins? Aye. Councilman Huppert? Aye. Councilwoman Sachs? Aye. Councilman Showalter? Aye. Councilman Stipes? Aye. It is 6 -0. Thank you very much. Under discussion by an action by mayor and council, council action on an ordinance to amend chapter 24 nuisance, nuisances of the town, Christopher Town Code in regards to article two, regulation of noise. The public hearing was held on April the 10th, 2018. Mayor, may I start by asking Mr. Dr. Casali a, a couple questions based on his comments this evening? Certainly. Okay. You're still here. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, sir. First of all, uh, on behalf of the folks here in the Planning Commission and actually the citizens here, uh, Dr. Casale has added a tremendous amount of technical expertise uh, pro bono to uh, to this cause. Uh, not He's been completely impartial uh, and it's been invaluable actually, uh, especially uh, the meeting last week. So uh, first of all, thank you and put you on the spot here since you mentioned the words plainly audible because I've had at least one conversation with another council member regarding this very thing because of your presentation last week. Do you happen to have a copy of the ordinance with you, the draft ordinance? I have it on my laptop. I don't have it. Okay. So, um, with that, let me let me read you on page four of our ordinance. Say again. You can have mine. Okay. You can, you can come on up here if you, if you feel comfortable or I can read it. Or, uh, oh, do you have it on? Can we put it on the screen here? Actually, yeah, I can get put it. you on the spot too, Andrew. Okay, so you have a copy of the ordinance there? Yes. Or the draft ordinance that uh, is dated April 2nd. On page four of that ordinance, under uh, noise is prohibited. Just above table one, there's a sentence or a paragraph that says, "Authorized permit operator cause any source of sound to produce sound that is plainly audible in another person's enclosed dwelling unit, or that exceeds the sound pressure levels in table one." Okay, so the words "plainly audible," you had you you spoke again about, and I thought from your presentation last week that that. Uh, perhaps has has some concern for enforcement because the term plainly audible varies from person to person is that are you based on your comments tonight is that still something we should that your recommend or your 
uh, expertise would say is wise to leave in or not wise to leave in. And the, the words I'm talking about is plainly audible in another person's enclosed dwelling. Yes, yeah, so when I first got into this, I guess first planning commission mm -hmm. meeting on this, uh, the ordinance was solely based upon a plainly audible criteria. Right. Mm -hmm. And you know, I some people mentioned that to me and asked me to take a look at it, so I did. And I had concerns with having that as the sole criteria. Okay. Certainly. And part of the reason for that is what I showed you all at the working <coughs> meeting last week, right? Which has to do with the ear of the beholder, right. where, as you know, a person ages, they're going to have natural age-induced hearing loss. So. Uh, if an older person goes out, it might not be audible to them, where if a young person without age-induced loss, it may indeed be audible. Gotcha. So that was the primary issue okay. with plainly audible. Um, and so, you know, my recommendation early on was to try to move things towards a more quantitative, objective measurement. Uh, you know, it's, it's a device that measures physical sound pressure level in the air and uh, it, you know it is what it is it's a physical measurement um, but through several iterations it ended up being an either or mr. Stice okay uh, okay the audible or okay uh, measured outdoors in decibels and on page five the same as it, it's true with uh, uh, I guess it's section 2433 uh, parenthesis three at the bottom it's, it's the same language in that is plainly audible uh, within another person's enclosed vehicle or plainly audible within the enclosed dwelling of another person another un dwelling unit of another person so I just wanted your thoughts on that and you've uh, you've described those okay yes uh, again I you know it's it's in there as a it's a subjective pair of words plainly audible it is what it is and uh, if you didn't have an either or type ordinance, I would be very uncomfortable with those words in isolation. Uh, as I said a few minutes ago, you know, when I was quoted by another resident, mm -hmm. I think that most of the measurements are going to end up in practice being outdoors on the receiving property mm -hmm. because uh, that's typically, I think, where an officer would end up going with a sound level meter, mm -hmm. which therefore leads you down the objective decibel measurement path. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor, if I could comment. Um, I, that is one thing that sort of, uh, I, I was not familiar with this decimal uh, machine at all before the meeting last week. And uh, one thing that really, uh, uh, gave me a lot of backing there is when you made the comment that one minute there could be a officer who's 20 years old and then later on an officer who is 60 years old come in there and it's going to be uh, uh, different and, and that is why it's good to have something like the machine that's going to be something that's constant and I thought I appreciated that and I wanted to have another comment here uh, maybe, maybe I heard the person wrong tonight, or maybe I heard Chief Sisson wrong the other day. But at our meeting the other day, well, I'm going to say tonight, I believe the person said that Chief Sisson was maybe going to have officers going around Christiansburg looking for people who are going over the noise levels and, and measuring it. And I did not hear that at all from Chief Sisson at all last week. I, what I heard from Chief Sisson was that they are not going to be proactive. Uh, and they're going to, if someone complains or somebody comes out, then they will look into it. But they're not going around looking for people who are going over the noise level. Is, is that right, Chief Sisson? Yes, sir. And I probably need to add to that. Okay. <coughs> So I think that brings up a good point, and it's important to clarify comments made in that public setting. Uh, my statement made last week was simple. Uh, we are not proactive in enforcing noise ordinance. Uh, we are more of a reactive force in that situation. That is normally a complaint-based issue uh, that we would respond to. So you are correct in that. 
I think the statement was made at the last uh, work session about a vehicle. You know, if the officer hears a vehicle on the highway that uh, the noise is in violation, yes, we would react to that, correct? Mm -hmm. That would be reactive, not proactive. Right, thank you. <clears throat> now, Mr. Mayor, can I say something with this too? Uh, Mr. Kraft and uh, Dr. Casale both said that we need to put in there about uh, the, the, the church bells, the ringing of the bells, and stuff like that. And I completely agree. Uh, how would you word that? Mm, no, Dr. Casale or Mr. Kraft. I would. Uh, you know, you've got legal counsel that can advise you on that, but my, my <coughs> solution would be if the past ordinance never had issues with that particular exclusion, just put it back in. Um, I don't know what issues you had, if any, with that last exclu with the exclusion that's in the ordinance now yeah. that's going to come out. But uh, if you ever had it, you never had a problem with really that, uh, legal or otherwise, then. I would just say put that back in. That would make the uh, chief citizen's life a whole lot easier because it's part of the ordinance. And if he gets a call at 11:02 about Christiansburg Presbyterian Church or some other church ringing their church bell, he can say they're exempt. He doesn't have to send an officer down there. That's right. That's right. Real quick, Mr. Kraft, you, you alluded to other than the church church bells, services, and events at the church. Well, that's what the ordinance states. Now, you know, I know uh, in the summertime, and now I'm not just speaking for uh, Christopher Presbyterian Church. Other churches have outdoor uh, <clears throat> services. You have funerals. You have weddings. All those things take place sometimes indoors, sometimes outdoors. Uh, there is a celebratory. It uh, could be a choir. It can be music. Be any of the things that make noise that relates to the religious activity that's taking place. And I, I fear from what I heard in the example Wednesday of the noise level that those things, I, I'm certain church bells will violate that noise. I, I'm absolutely certain of that. And I would think that, uh, you know, sunrise services, uh, churches that have those that are generally outdoors. I mean, we all know there are groups out there that target, target religious activities <clears throat> as relates to legal and governmental agencies and things like that. That's why you have a moment of silence now and you don't have a prayer. I, I would be shocked that there wouldn't be somebody or some group <clears throat> anti-religion or whatever their agenda may be that when they hear those church bells or they whatever, they're going to pick the phone up and call the police. And uh, you don't want to have to deal with that. He doesn't want to have to deal with that. And, and I'm quite certain most people don't want to have to have that problem to face. And uh, unless there's some reason that the old exclusion can't be incorporated into the new one, I mean, I don't know. Maybe there is, maybe there's not. But that's what I'm asking for. If you can include that again, I think that would make life a lot simpler for at least the religious aspect and the you know, violations that could be generated because of that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I've used activities protected under the Constitution of the United States of America, the Bill of Rights. Okay. Any other questions, comments from council? Yeah, I'll go. I'll go ahead. I, I started to prepare some remarks tonight, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to get uh, just go ahead and lay some things out there. And I, I'd like to first start by saying that the reason we're here is a demonstration of what Chief Sisson has emphasized, and that is we are we are not here because we're going out looking for trouble, or we're going out looking uh, for you know. Uh, violations we're we're here because there's been concerns expressed <clears throat> and they've been documented and the reason we're here is because we are reacting and we're trying to find uh, the, the common ground uh, for everyone's concerns and that's a difficult challenge it's a tall it's a tall order <clears throat> along those lines <clears throat> we to address this issue we've had five public 
comment input sessions. We've had a tremendous amount of deliberation <clears throat> that's been detailed. It's, it's included expert without interference or nuisance that's that's not a negative term uh, it is simply a legal term and that's what we're trying to do right now is to define what that what that threshold is for a nuisance or interference for people being able to enjoy their property so with that being said with all the input that we've received I'm uh, I'm comfortable, as Abraham Lincoln would say, he was new. He was he felt comfortable that he was where he needed to be on complex situations and compromises when everyone was good and upset. And I think that's sort of, I mean, we're find that we've found a sweet spot here that I think is a is a step off point. Uh, but I do have a few. So in essence, uh, I do support the ordinance as a, the draft ordinance that's presented to us on April second with a few minor modifications. And I'll also entertain other council members' uh, thoughts, but I'd like to throw out there basically adopting the draft ordinance that we have <clears throat> with a, uh, I do have concerns about exempting churches. Uh, I'm all for church bells, I like them, uh, but we're, I think we're showing favorites. I think we're, I think we're maybe being uh, not impartial, but we're being partial, just a thought after everything I've heard. So, uh, but in, in, in sensitivity to the concerns uh, that I've heard, I would recommend that we have a, an, uh, that the town the, assumes the cost of a permit process uh, for an application, a single application, uh, up to August 1st. That's a slight, that's uh, a, little over, a little over three months. So I'd just say August 1st for anyone. And that could include uh, to to address the church issue. They could send in a one, uh, you know, they could send in a simple request, and we can consider that. But I think the the conditional <coughs> use permit, pro or the excuse me, the ordinance, <clears throat> uh, with that modification, and also based on Dr. Casali's comments uh, on sheet five, I do have concerns then with the uh, uh, the playing of music inside of a car. That's basically. Uh, that's basically based on plainly audible only. So I would exempt, I would also uh, omit paragraph three based on that. We don't have any objective measuring devices for that. And I think that's it that's for a starting point. I'll throw that out there. Is that a form of motion? Um, <clears throat> no, no, I'd like to hear some discussion on that first. I tell you what, I was going to um, hold these comments until I voted, but I think uh, Ms. Banks has started off a good thing here. So I'm going to give you a little bit of, of my opinion, uh, but just really quickly here. I echo some of the things that, that he said, and uh, I've been, I've, I've attended numerous meetings here concerning this noise ordinance. I think he put out the ever five, it seems like it's been, been more than that. I tell you, I know the Planning Commission uh, spent a lot of time with this too, and I have a very high opinion of the Planning Commission, and I was on it for a while, and they do a, a good job, a thorough job of looking into things, and, and they, they supported this ordinance. Um, I've heard, we already mentioned about the decimal. Uh, meters and all that, and I, uh, I mentioned I was, uh, after hearing that briefing, I, I was, uh, felt I it was really, uh, received some good intelligence on that. I've talked to Chief Sisson a number of times concerning this, and I've gotten his opinion and how he's going to react to the situation and how he feels about the situation, and how his people will react to that situation. Um, Last, as it was mentioned, I did attend the uh, Starlight last Friday night, and I 
stayed there and I walked around the car a lot and I, uh, I felt I had a good good feeling for that. And then Sunday afternoon I went to the Soul Shack and they had their religious uh, um, recital or whatever and I was there for that too. So I, I have looked into the situations in, in both areas. And, and I don't want I don't want anybody to think that this is a feud between the citizens or the business portion of, of Christiansburg and the Christiansburg Town Council. And that is not true at all. But I have to say this though, we here on the Town Council, we support everybody in this community. We support the, the residential people, we, and we are doing that, and that is our job. Our job is to make it good or better for everyone we can. And that, that is our responsibility, and that's why you guys elected us, to have that ramification for that. <clears throat> the church bell, too, thing, I, I think that we should put something about that in, in the ordinance. Um, so I'm gonna, when, I, when we have this, the, the vote tonight, I am going to vote to support the ordinance. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. <coughs> hey, yes, sir. Uh, Andrew, can you explain uh, real fast to the folks? Uh, CUP, uh, how long it, it's good for and a quick process of it? Because uh, some people think it's got to be done every month, every year, or whatever. Right, a conditional use permit, once approved, would run with the land. So it would be good for as long as the use is continued and the use is in compliance with the conditions. Uh, there could be a condition that stated that it would be uh, looked at every 12 months. There are some conditional use permits that have that, but that would be up uh, to the final approval if that were to be a condition. Otherwise, it runs with the, the land and that doesn't and, uh, and so it is continual uh, with, with the land and, uh, and would not end uh, and would would uh, would be carried with the use as long as the use uh, were to continue as approved. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, one other comment: the conditional use permit. Uh, since I didn't prepare remarks, the concerns I heard from several of the speakers, not just tonight but previously, I would I would ask that those people that are concerned with this council's reasonableness would give us a chance to work out a conditional use permit that addresses some of the things that have been discussed, such as there has to be a baseline of understanding, that's ordinance, but there's also a special permission, which is a conditional use permit process, and I think if you talk, I, I think we're very reasonable minded in that area, and that, that will address, I think, a lot of the other concerns that there has with background noise and all these other things that uh, there are some concerns about. Um, I would I would ask the public to trust you know trust that we are not interested in we're not interested in you know uh, harming we're interested in in what's best you know for the community but a lot of those concerns I think are going to be site specific there's a good word uh, they're going to be site specific and we'll take all those into account and uh, with between the planning commission and us so uh, I did want to say that conditional use permit process. Is, is not meant as a burden, it's actually meant as uh, a, a vehicle for us to take into consideration those particular uses that you have envisioned and also some of the other site-specific uh, attributes, which would be background noise and, and so forth. So, yeah. Okay. Um, I have about five, so bear with me, please. Um, on section 24-33 of the proposed code, I am not in favor of plainly audible. I think it's way too subjective and that decibel readings are a little bit more quantitative that you can stand behind. So I'm not in favor of that to continue to be in there. Section 24-35, section C, I have a concern the way that portion is written. Currently, <coughs> If a property owner has a patron on their lot creating a noise nuisance, the property owner will be cited. 
I don't think <coughs> that's 100% accurate in my book. I feel like if the business owner has done their due diligence to work with the patron, at some point, they need to call law enforcement to enforce the regulations, just like an average citizen would, therefore putting the burden and the citation on the offender and not the business owner or renter, etc. As it currently reads, the business owner would be the one still getting the violation, and I disagree with that. Um, I, I do also feel that businesses have been the most affected by this noise change thus creating an urgency for us to fix it as fast as possible. I don't feel like we're going to have a resolution that's fair to everybody across the board, which is creating the need for the conditional use permit. Um, government should never stand in the way of a business's revenue stream. And that's another need for us to get this fixed right away as soon as we can so businesses can get back to order. Right now, I propose that the CUP request be free for 30 to 90 days because it's not the businesses that required this modification. Um, it has been handed down for us to tighten it up. So the fee in my book is unfair and I've requested with some support um, to waive the fee for a set period of time so businesses do not have to pay $750. Um, and last, I do feel um, I'd like to request that our conditional use permit wording be a little bit more clear. If you look at section 42-8, I read that at least five times and I still could not clearly understand it. I did have to call for clarification and so I feel like the mass public is also not going to clearly understand it. And I would like for it to be clearly noted uh, what uh, Mr. Warren expressed, which was it's good for the duration of the property unless the activity has changed for a duration of two years, which does seem logical. If you're not using the property for the same reason that you did to start with or the conditional use permit, it would cease to exist and you would have to reapply. Um, so those are the issues that I have that I would like to have some consideration brought to. And as it stands right now, my vote would be no. My only comment is what Mr. Kraft stated is, once again, with the church bales, I'm sure there's a way where they could be put back in, but then I know some could turn around and say, well, you're showing favoritism to the religious groups. Mm -hmm. So right now, we're kind of in a no-win situation, but I would hope that we could do something with the church bales. Yeah. Um, I agree with that completely. Mr. Showalter? Mark, how many calls have you got received over your career about church bales? No, no. That's what I thought. Okay. And Andrew, with the decibel levels, um, can you tell us how that came to play? Because I know the the initial public, uh, or not public hearing, but public input sec section, that was not included in that. It was it was clearly audible. That was which was initially what I was in favor for. But then the decibel uh, meter came about after that first mm -hmm. meeting. Can you tell tell us a little bit about that? That's correct. After the comments from the first public meeting. Uh, we went back and uh, we had done initial research, but we looked at uh, some of the uh, ordinances uh, you know, that we looked at before, plus uh, ordinance from Winchester that was cited to us from the public. Uh, and uh, we took a look at that and their decibel levels. Uh, at that time, also, Dr. Casali had provided a model noise ordinance from, uh, that was produced in New Jersey uh, that we took a look at as well. And then also we looked at, at some of those ordinances that we looked at uh, uh, from other localities. One was Montgomery County, and, and ultimately uh, that, that is where uh, the Planning Commission ended up uh, looking at for the residential uh, standards and pairing it with Montgomery County's current residential decibel levels uh, and the, uh, in the, the 65 decibel levels for, for businesses, uh, for commercial areas, was, uh, was consistent with, uh, with the New Jersey model ordinance and, and a number of others that we looked at. And so it was really a progression through the uh, uh, through the review period and, and the public meetings and the planning commission. Okay, planning. so it was it was cited in in the first public input session yes, to include it, and it wasn't in there. And then uh, uh, Dr. Casale, I mean that 
I appreciate his expertise. And like Brad said, that he worked for free uh, to help the town with this. He chose no sides. And uh, that work session that I attended last week was, it was an eye-opening experience for me. I really enjoyed the knowledge that I got from that. I guess I'm sort of trying to wrap my head about around, Brad, what you were looking to include in, in a possible motion. And then Steve had mentioned something about the church events and the bells as well. So I am in support of the ordinance as it stands right now. I think there was, as Brad said, and I agree with it, we had ample public input. We vetted it. We have an incredible uh, planning commission. And the work session again last week, I learned a lot. And um, it, it necessarily didn't sell me on it. I know any ordinance isn't perfect, but I do think this will help all property owners in town. But I guess I want to. Make my my concern with that, and the, you know, my concern is that we're setting ourselves up, and rightly so, for playing favorites. If we if we go through and approve the ordinance and the CUP process, as you know, as, as we've decided, with maybe some minor tweaks to it, it's a very simple application process for for a church to apply for us, mm -hmm. and and we're not, and and they could, you know, just like anyone else, any the any you know any leave that that process open, and we you know. Uh, but I do have concerns with showing uh, we're setting ourselves up for, and rightfully so, I think, for criticism <coughs> that we're showing partiality. So uh, that's just a, that's a, that's a concern. Of course, the other side of that is, you know, the less government is a better government. And if we have to say who when church, churches can ring bells or they can't ring bells, then there's going to be something else more and more. I just think there has to be some latitude here, and and we just can't be uh, putting everything down that has to be go through and, and get an amendment for that. Uh, so I, I I disagree with that. Well, churches are run like businesses, so we shouldn't treat a church any different than a business, in my opinion. <clears throat> I mean, I'm not going to fight over it, but right. you know. and I, I think that's just a consideration we need to. Mm -hmm. And you know, the bells are going to be loud. Sorry, this is a discussion by I have, council. Okay, I, thank you. No one has mentioned thank you. Thank sound, you. direct sound reflection, thank you. and wind okay. and mountains versus okay. New Jersey. I have to go, but <laughs> you all are mentioning all that about direct sound reflection. More. Things in New Jersey are going to be different than mountains in Virginia. If the wind is blowing, the bells are going to be louder. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I, I do want to say I do support the free CUP process for up to 90 days for an, estab an established business, okay, which this noise, if we vote in, will affect. But it's a one-time application. I would like that to get on there. Can I just say something from a legal standpoint? And believe me, I don't want to say anything. <laughs> but the ordinance was written in a particular way to meet the latest um, case law that's been out there with regard to trying it to be content neutral, not to be playing, you know, picking and choosing what types of speech can happen or sound can happen. The sound can be interpreted as speech. And that is why we didn't put in every single solitary exemption. And we feel that if someone feels like they need an exemption, that they can handle it through the CUP process, um, which gives us some more latitude, but will not invalidate our ordinance and doesn't kick it up into a higher level of scrutiny if it gets challenged. Not because we want to discriminate against anybody or anything like that. It's just that the, the way that the, you know, the courts are coming down on ordinances and you, they have to be as content neutral as possible. So that's why we did not put that exemption in there. Secondly, the reason for the cars, that there's no decibel level reading, is because it's almost virtually impossible to get a decibel reading on a moving target. Um, otherwise, you won't be able to enforce car sounds at all. Um, you know, generally speaking, you'd have to catch them in a stoplight and the officer would be have to be able to you know, fumble around, get his, you know, sound meter, hopefully he has it, and then try to get a sound level on a car that be speeding away, you know, in moments. So that is one of the reasons that's written the way it is. Um, with regards to the, the need for plainly audible, plainly audible standard has been upheld in numerous courts around the country. 
the plainly audible standard itself is not subjective, according to the court. What was subjected in Tanner versus Virginia Beach was they outlawed, I mean, they um, basically um, made a criminal violation sounds that um, offend the reasonable person. It was how they defined the sounds that would be subject to a criminal violation that was at issue there. It wasn't the fact that you tried to explain how you, um, you know, determine if someone, if you can hear the sound in someone's home, that's clear, you clearly can say, this is, this sound is gone with the wind and it's inside my house and it doesn't belong here. My television, what I'm watching on TV <coughs> belongs here. That's the problem right there. Most of the time, the levels will be taken outside. You know, if, but we don't want to have to be dependent on that sound level meter. If the officer is called to the scene and they don't happen to have one, and the person allows them into their house and it is so loud that you can plainly hear it in the house, to me, you know, that's a trespass in somebody's private dwelling. And if we can't do anything about that, you know, we're not serving the citizens. So that's why the need for the plainly audible. I would certainly recommend our officers take an outside reading, you know, if at all possible, because that is objective. But there has to be an alternative measure in case of a situation where they're, you know, maybe the meter is down, they don't have one available, or the officer that responds doesn't have a meter for some reason. We need to be able to enforce all of our laws. And that is a standard that the courts have upheld. So, you know, I'm more than happy to make any changes. I just need to give you my legal opinion on the yeah. record because if we change it and something goes bad, I just want you to be aware of that. Thank you. I'll, I'll go ahead and throw I'll go through and throw a motion out there and see uh, how it goes since everyone's signed. Uh, Mr. Bishop, you, have you yeah, he's, said anything? You said what uh, you want to uh, say? Sam, I okay. Worth. So we're done. Uh, I'll go ahead and throw something out there for uh, for consideration. I'll go ahead and uh, I'm satisfied with. Everything I've heard about my, or, you know, things we've talked about. So I'll go ahead and throw something out there that we approve the ordinance as presented, uh, waiving the fee or however you want to word that. If we assume the fee or whatever, until August first uh, of two thousand and eighteen, um, and and I think, and and I'm I'm fine with the wording. I'm fine with the wording. No exceptions. I'll just go ahead and throw that out there in the form of a motion that we approve it as is, uh, with that with uh, waiving the fee or assuming the fee until August 1st of 2018, close of business that day. Assuming the fee for one time For one time, for, for one time. That that's right, that's correct. For anybody. For anybody? Yes. Okay. That's, that would, to be impartial. So we're approving the ordinance with this. Uh, 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 waiving the fee. Waiving the fee. For, the, for, a, for a single, you know, for a single process. Uh, for a time period exceeding 90 days, it's actually August 1st. I'll second. But we don't have to put that in the ordinance, right? We're not putting that in. We're not writing that in. That's just no. the policy. Okay. Whatever. Yes. I am trust you all to yes. do uh, carry that out. Yeah. So I have a motion and a second uh, to approve the ordinance as presented with a few additions. Is that what we're looking at? Or is as presented? With the understanding that we will waive the fee. Yes. Okay. I have a motion and second. Any other comments or discussions from council? Yeah. If we find out that this is not exactly smooth as we anticipate, are we open to going back and fixing it? Sure. We, we, always, always, we can change our minds two weeks from now if we want to. As a majority. Yeah. As a majority. As a majority okay. Right. Okay. All right. Not such a week. Well, Madam, <laughs> Madam Clerk, would you please poll council? Yes, sir. Councilman Bishop? Aye. Councilman Collins? Aye. Councilman Huppert? Aye. Councilwoman Sachs? Nay. Councilman Showalter? Aye. Councilman Stipes? Aye. I believe I have that 5-1 and that motion carries. Next is the uh, ordinance to amend Chapter 42 zoning of the Christiansburg Town Code in regards to permitting a loudspeaker sound amplification outdoor sound system to be used in excess of the Chapter 24 Nuisance Article 2 
regulation of noise by conditional use permit in the A, MU1, MU2, B1, B2, B3, I1, and I2 zoning districts. Public hearing was also held on April the 10th. I make a motion, similarly make a motion to support the ordinance uh, to amend <coughs> Chapter 42 zoning to, uh, to accommodate a conditional use permit process as presented to us. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussions or comments, concerns? Hearing none, Madam Clerk. Yes, sir. Councilman Bishop? Aye. Councilman Collins? Aye. Councilman Huppert? Aye. Councilwoman Sachs? Aye. Councilman Showalter? Aye. Councilman Stipes? Aye. That is 5 1, and that motion carries. Agreement to uh, amend Montgomery Regional Solid Waste Authority Articles of Incorporation. We discussed this a little earlier. That's the change in the change in the uh, staggering of the terms, and the members the agreement would be extended from 2025 to 2040. Do I have a motion? So moved. Got a motion? Got second. A motion and a second. Any discussion? Madam Clerk. Yes, sir. Councilman Bishop. Aye. Councilman Collins. Aye. Councilman Huppert? Aye. Councilwoman Sachs? Aye. Councilman Showalter? Aye. Councilman Stipes? Aye. That is 6 -0. thank you. Resolution authorizing participation in the Virginia Department of Housing and Community Development, <coughs> DHCD Commercial District Affiliate Program. Mr. Winfield, is that yours? Uh, yes, me and Andrew. Uh, basically, this uh, the uh, Virginia Main Street program is run through the Department of Housing and Community Development. They have a, I guess, kind of a semi-program that without the, the commitments of the Main Street program, it's called the Affiliate Program, and this is basically application for that program. There is no monetary commitment from the town with this, although it does open us up a little bit to a little more additional funding and assistance from DHCD and with the idea that you might be moving towards the Main Street program, but there is no commitment at this point. Okay. Do I have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the resolution as presented by Mr. Winfield. I'll second. Got a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? Madam Clark? Yes, sir. Councilman Bishop? Aye. Councilman Collins? Aye. Councilman Hubbard? Aye. Councilwoman Sachs? Aye. Councilman Showalter? Aye. Councilman Stites? Aye. Mr. Showalter, the next item is yours consideration of attendance payments for New River Valley Regional Commission dinner. Yes, I put this on there. Um, uh, Harry Collins and I, and uh, Mr. Johnson, a member of our planning commission, are members of the regional commission. And uh, they typically have an annual, um, I'm not going to say dinner, but a it's an awards presentation. It's an awards presentation. Yeah. And uh, this year it's going to be at Sinkland. And uh, one of our very own, one of our local business owners, are going to be honored along uh, with uh, um, another individual at this. And typically it's, it's, it's attended lightly by council members. Um, there is a cost to it, but I would like for consideration of this body, much like the chamber, much like the NAACP, uh, any banquet that uh, that the town this year cover the cost of uh, each each one of us, uh, possibly even any staff members or any planning commissioners, Mr. Johnson, who wish to attend and their spouses. Um, I, I'm doing this because I think it would it would show uh, incredible support from from the town if we all attend or if we all can attend and uh, support this individual who's going to get this this award that was voted on by your regional commissioners and it, it's a big deal it, it is and it's a local person let them know local. you wouldn't tell them well i mean harry i was going to leave that to you oh, no, <laughs> no, you, are, no, you go ahead you go ahead no no i'll leave it to you all all right. Right. Where do go? <laughs> it's mr david hagan and uh <laughs> moss uh, is he also it's a citizen of the valley, huh? Pet Moss, Pet Moss, we love his Yeah, but Mr. Hagen and uh, it was uh, it's a link, it's not really a link, lengthy uh, submission for these applicants, but you have to establish why they're get, getting presented this award. And Mr. Hagen has showed uh, his input for our region, not just in the town of Christiansburg, he does have a 
footprint here, uh, but Pulaski, uh, especially with what he's done downtown Pulaski, and of course the ball team in Pulaski. So it resonates throughout your community. And those of you who aren't familiar with the Regional Commission, uh, I would encourage you to sort of look into it. Um, it it's, it's popular uh, with the members now, and that's due to the staff that is sort of the lobbyist for our, our region. But Kevin Bird and staff do a great job, and of course the members as well. But it's it's a huge honor. And I know that this is somebody that Harry and I submitted due to uh, his deeds that he's done for the yeah. whole region. And again, I, I'm not. I can talk all night about. But what, if your consideration, I, I, would, I would like your consideration. To yeah, one of the big things that he does is he helps all the schools around the whole area. You know, not just schools here, but schools all the way towards the southwest Virginia. That's right. I, I, would, I, would, I would support that, and with the wording, I would say a council member <coughs> and staff member and a guest. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> sure. Uh, to make it, make it very Is clear. that a form of a motion? Is that a form of a motion? I would make a motion for I'll that. I'll second that. You got a motion and a second? And that's no different than what we've done in the past, I don't think. No, I don't think we've no, so. supported that in the past, and I think a good showing would be nice. Any other discussion? Madam Clark? Yes, sir. Councilman Bishop? Uh, Councilman Collins? Aye. Councilman Hubbard? Aye. Councilwoman <coughs> Sachs? Aye. Councilman Showalter? Aye. Councilman Stites? Aye. That is 6 -0. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Huppert, this is yours. Consideration of $2,500 funding for the Blacksburg Children's Museum. Yes, thank you. Uh, I know we're not going to talk about the budget tonight. We're going to be talking about it at the next meeting. But I just wanted to uh, bring this up today so that council can think about it and be, be prepared uh, in our next meeting. You know, uh, the Blacksburg Children's Museum was on the uh, list of uh, places that we were considering supporting, you know, in our budget, and, and we didn't because uh, it, it's the Blacksburg Children's Museum. But I wanted people maybe to start thinking about this, and there was there's an article here in the paper that was in here last week, and anybody can look at it if they want, that the uh, Blacksburg Children's Museum is, is considering changing from Blacksburg and they're going to move into the uh, hopefully into the New River Mall and uh, part of the area that they're going to uh, uh, locate at is where the food market is right now and where the uh, clothing stores are just uh, closed so it's going to be a huge area and will be a huge plus for the uh, New River Mall uh, and uh, this uh, facility they have uh, not only handles you know, people here, but there's a thing for tourism, and they just asked for two hundred, uh, what two thousand, uh, two hundred fifty dollars, and I think it would be a good thing if council we reconsidered and we decided to uh, award this money to them this year, and it would be just sort of a good way for us to say, hey, we're happy to see you here, and we support you, and uh, who knows. Uh, by this time next year, they will be calling it the Christianburg uh, Children's Museum, and I think we'll all be ahead of the game. And so that's uh, so. Next 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 meeting, I'll probably bring that up as a, as a motion. And that that's all I have on that. Uh, Miss Tweedy, was this one of the applications that was late? No, no, no I was, was here. It was, was on time. Okay. No. So that they're they're looking for a regional moniker for that, but I think that's a good. What does that mean? Since we're not discussing tonight, I guess. No, we don't. I say we don't discuss it tonight. Yeah, okay. I think it's. I appreciate you bringing that. Hey, Harry, that's what I thought. That's a good point too. Town. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was. Staff reports. Town manager. Uh, I'd like to reschedule the budget for the public hearing uh, for the for the budget and also the water and sewer rate fees uh, to May the twenty fourth. I d uh, forgot to get that in on time. Fallon actually emailed it to uh, Tracy and I told uh, Tracy I wanted to look at it first and wound up missing the deadline by a little bit. So May twenty fourth. Yep. Rescheduled to twenty twenty second. Twenty second. That's the public hearing. Yes. Also, we'd like to schedule a public hearing for a conditional use permit for the Starlight Drive-In for June 12th to permit a sound system in excess of Chapter 24 nuisances. 
Bon. In the B3 General Business District. Okay. And I was talking with Adam today. At some point, he would like to have a either a work session on IT, maybe 15 minutes or so with you in regards to uh, migrating your email over to a new system. And he just kind of wants to give you kind of details on that. He could do it in a work session, although it would take maybe 15 or 20 minutes. I know we don't have any work sessions scheduled. Or you can come in and see them on an individual or maybe two at a time basis, if you'd like. Mm -hmm. However you'd like to handle. I'm a little slow. I think I'd like to go where I'm going. I would, too. Mm -hmm. okay. I think that's a good idea. Okay. So, well, if you could, then, in the next couple of weeks, if you could, make an appointment to come in and see Adam for about okay. 15 or 20 minutes. So we email that directly to Adam, coordinate with Adam directly, or coordinate through you? If you can, I'll, I'll send you an email. Okay. You can do a doodle poll or something, guys, sure. whatever those okay. three things yep. are. Okay. Times. Thank you. We're okay with the request to uh, change <coughs> the, the uh, public hearing public the hearing in, in, in the CUP. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's all Anything okay. else? Sure. Madam Attorney? Hi, nice. <laughs> Any other staff here that would like to present? I'd be happy if I never talk. Council reports. Uh, this sucks. Let's go. All right. Um, Central Business Committee meeting met on April 18th. And first of all, I'd like to mention farmers markets open May 3rd. Do your best to attend. We appreciate the support. We're working really hard to make sure that that is uh, as successful as possible. Um, let's see, uh, we, obviously we heard from some people tonight, but the neighbors were reached concerning the street closures. Um, discussion about a little bit more of the arches and the lighting occurred at the meeting. And uh, the parking study from Virginia Tech was discussed. Um, the affiliate application, which was um, discussed this evening as well. So I'm kind of like reiterating things we already talked about. Uh, we briefly discussed uh, the new transit edition called Rad Row, um, which is Roanoke Road. And then, I don't know how many people saw this, but Governor Northam um, created opportunity zones. And I requested that the next meeting we dive into that and determine exactly how that affects us so we can make positive changes to utilize that if we possibly can. And the next meeting is set for May 9th at noon. <clears throat> okay, Mr. Hopper. Mike, I might be stealing some of your thunder. Uh, what this Friday is going to be the uh, wine and uh, it's called wine and cheese. Wine or, and artisan. Yeah. Uh, and, and and are you going to go over that? No. I, and what, what not time? now. It's going to be Friday on, on Hickok. <laughs> and uh, what are the times on that? Five to seven. Five to seven. And, and, uh, five to nine, I'm sorry. Yeah. Five to nine. Yeah. And, and if you haven't been there, they did, they've done a real good job the last couple of years. And it uh, looks like the weather is going to be nice, which will be good. And and uh, they get, get a chance to go down to uh, on Hickok uh -huh. and see how it is. Is it? Thank you, Mr. Stipes. There's no report. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. <clears throat> Showalter? None. Mr. Bishop? None. You're not going to talk about going to watch the rescue squad retire the screaming demon this past weekend? Well, I figured you was going to do that. No, I <laughs> just talk about it. All right, well, this past weekend, the rescue squad had a uh, celebration, per se, for its honor life members. And for what we, I used to call Rescue One, which is the big truck you see here in town. That truck's been in service for, believe it or not, 30 years now. So probably next week it's going to be taken out of service. So it did kind of have like a little get together. Uh, it was well attended. A decommissioning of sorts. It was. A decommissioning of the truck, because once again, it is, uh, people see that truck, they know it's from Christian's Rep, but unfortunately, probably next week will be the last time you see it in town. Said. Yeah, it's a big. You're gonna replace it, I think, with a smaller, smaller truck, smaller right. unit, I guess, from uh, maneuverability. Right, Mr. Collins. I'm sorry, Mr. Bishop. You do? I'll finish now. Mm -hmm. No, you can't. I'll finish. Was good. No, I'll finish. <laughs> Harry, I'm good. Thanks. 
Uh, reiterate with uh, a couple of things that Mr. Hubbard, uh, wine and artisan, I believe that there's, there are vendors, there are uh, food and wine. I think I, I know there's, there, there is a food source or two down there. Uh, Ms. Sachs talked about the farmer's market. I, I talked with uh, Casey Jenkins this morning, and I think he is up to 15 confirmed vendors and wow. working on another one that would probably blow the doors off. That's what you guess. So and they've got uh, the schedule has been released for the events through the summer, pretty much. So I think that's a good thing. Uh, uh, that's pretty much, uh, I will remind everyone again, and I'll do it prior to, the uh, May 9th, Mark, he's going to, that's, I believe that is the uh, dedication, of, rededication and reopening of the town park in, in honor of our fallen officers. I will send that out ahead yeah. of time to let you all know. It's a Wednesday, I do believe. So we're with that. Uh, General Mike, we might want to mention your thing on on Thursday, courts thing. Yes, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I sent an email out to council, but uh, the Thursday night at six o'clock at the courthouse, and I believe it was on the fourth floor. Uh, they're having a their annual presentation since April is Child Abuse Prevention Month. They they have a really good program. They have a good speaker coming, and this is the fourth fifth year that they've done that. And of course, we have we have. Uh, declared uh, April as Child Abuse Prevention Month. So uh, if you're able to come out and, uh, and support, I think it's a, I'm going to guess probably an hour and a half at best. Yeah, what time to start? Six o'clock. Six. Six o'clock. And they have, I think they do a really nice job. They have some, some uh, refreshments and some food set out for them. Anything else to come for council? Gentlemen, thank you. Lady and gentlemen, thank you. It was a long evening, but a good evening. We're adjourned.